Okay, so we'll get started. Um, so we're very happy to have Anthony Ashmore um, speaking to us today from all the way from the University of Chicago in the US. Um, and he is going to tell us about Calabi metrics, numerical methods, and maybe some random matrix theory. So over to you, Anthony. Thanks, Jock. Um, can everyone see the slides okay? Yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, yeah, thanks very much. So uh, thank you for having me. It's great to, uh, great to talk to people all the way across the globe. I guess it's the morning there, it's the evening here. Uh, so we're probably both tired, which is good. Um, so um, I'm gonna be telling you today about sort of uh, some recent work that people have been doing and I've been doing myself on calculating numerical Calabia metrics. I'm gonna sort of review uh, how you get these numerical metrics, uh, how you can compute the spectrum of the Laplacian, which turns out to be sort of an interesting quantity uh, for these manifolds, and also tell you some sort of interesting and surprising links uh, between these metrics and conformal field theories and random matrix theory. So this is with my collaborators here at uh, Chicago, Nima Afkani Jetty and Clay Cordova. And this is based on a, a recent paper that came out uh, a couple of months ago now. So let me sort of give you the, the, uh, the, the very quick overview for those of you who, who, who fall asleep during the talk. Um, so Calabia metrics, as I'll review, are very important for string phenomenology and also important for understanding conformal field theories, particularly two-dimensional conformal field theories with some degree of supersymmetry. And the spectrum of the Laplacian on these manifolds, uh, when they're equipped with their Ricci flat metric, both encodes something about the geometry of these manifolds and also the spectrum of operators in these conformal field theories in a way that I'll describe. Recently, we have new numerical methods to actually compute uh, these Ricci flat metrics. There are no analytic uh, expressions for these metrics, so you have to resort to numerics. And I'm gonna tell you how these numerics work and how you can compute things such as the spectrum of these, of, of these metrics. And then I'm gonna give you one example of something sort of cool you can do with this, with this new data that we have available to us. And uh, in that idea, I'll show you that these uh, conformal field theories, which are defined in some way by Calabi-Yau's, which I'll describe later, uh, when you average over their complex structure, when you average over some parameter um, to get some ensemble of theories, it turns out that the spectrum of these conformal field theories, these highly non-trivial conformal field theories, uh, display something called random matrix statistics, which is sort of surprising. And as far as I'm aware, there's, there's no known reason why this happens. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about all of these things in the next sort of uh, 15 minutes or so. So to start, I just wanna have a, a very quick review of, of sort of obvious motivations for why we study calabi owls why we're interested in calabi manifolds and the and metrics on them. And the most obvious one is just does string theory describe our universe? And it's turned out that over the past 30 years or so, um, the theories or the models that get closest to uh, realistic uh, models of particle physics with minimal supersymmetry and the standard model gauge group come from just considering the heterotic string on a calabi out threefold equipped with some, with some gauge degrees of freedom. Now, usually when you're building these kind of models, you sort of focus on getting uh, the correct gauge group, the standard model gauge group, the right matter spectrum, so the right number of generations of things like quarks and leptons. And then you sort of worry about, you know, are there particular couplings, which are fixed by some super potential that vanish or don't vanish? Perhaps you want to stop things like proton decay. Um, but the issue is that you, you can't really make any sharp predictions uh, using this sort of very coarse information that we have available. And the reason for that is that a lot of this information just comes from, uh, from topological information about the Calabi app. If you really want to check how many of these string models, how many of these string vacua are sort of physically reasonable, you need to start being able to make sharp predictions, sharp calculations, things like decay rates, masses of particles, couplings, and so on. And for that, you really need uh, the Calabi metrics on these manifolds. And I'll tell you more about that in the next few slides. So as I said, um, you know, one of the problems of string theory is that it's meant to be a theory of everything. We should be able to compute particle masses, couplings, supersymmetry breaking, and so on directly from this theory. Um, if, it's, if it's a minimally supersymmetric theory, we get in four dimensions. That theory is fixed by some Kähler potential, for example. And then the low energy degrees of freedom are just fixed by uh, the eigenmodes of the Laplacian on the manifold. And I'll talk more about this later. 
And as I said earlier, the issue is that there are no explicitly known Calabio metrics. So you have no way of computing uh, the eigenmodes or really any of the information that goes into uh, sharp calculations of phenomenology from these heterotic models. So what I'll be talking about in this talk is, is how you can get access to this information uh, numerically, particularly the information of the metric and some applications to conformal field theories, which I'll talk more about. Um, and I should say, if there are any questions, feel free to stop me at any point. I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not completely wedded to getting entirely through the talk, so uh, please interrupt. Here's a question. Yes. Um, when you talk about eigenmodes of the Poisson on Calabi-Yells, yep. given the metric um, for the physics, are you um, talking about the Poisson acting on functions only or on forms and spinners? So, so. Um, I am going to tell you how to calculate uh, the Laplacian acting on forms in this case. Um, and then there's usually a map toward to, to spinners uh, because, uh, because it's clever. Yeah. Um, ideally, to compute the actual physical couplings and things, you also need to couple to, to some gauge field. And then you need to compute the eigenmodes, uh, which are also coupled to the gauge field. And, and that's sort of a, a work in progress. But I'll, I'll tell you how to do the, the, the forms, the forms. Yeah, I have a, another very naive question. Uh, so you, you've mentioned the heterotic string, but uh, do this statement mm -hmm. also hold for type two, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 this is more motivation. Um, okay. if, if you have, you know, any string model that leads to an n equal to one theory, you know, there's a Caleb potential and a super potential, and you need to be able to compute effectively some harmonic modes which appear in those, in those potentials. And for that, you need to compute these eigenmodes from the metric. Okay. So let me just sort of review quickly how this all works. So if you just want minimal supersymmetry in four dimensions, just thinking about heterotic theory for now, that means we have, you know, and we also have some gauge bundle over our manifold X. If there's no H flux, there's no three form flux H, then this just tells us, supersymmetry tells us that X has to be calabi yau equipped with its Ritchie flat metric. And the gauge bundle admits some particular kind of connection called a hemish and yang mills connection that I won't say much about. As I was just saying, the, the physics in four dimensions is fixed by the geometry of the manifold X of the calabi -Yau. In particular, just doing a Kaluza Klein reduction on the calabi uh, fixes the low energy degrees of freedom that affect the physics. So for example, if I just uh, expand for scalars, for example, the 10 dimensional uh, wave equation, one finds that the, the eigenmodes of the Laplacian on the internal space on the calabi -Yau, correspond to massive modes in four dimensions where the mass scale is set by the eigenvalue uh, of the Laplacian on the internal space. So if you're just interested in, in phenomenology, you'll probably just worry about the zero modes and those are the ones that determine the low energy physics. In particular, things like matter fields are going to come from uh, harmonic modes. So functions, P forms that satisfy this sort of equation valued in some bundle D. But of course, if we don't know the metric, we don't know uh, the gauge connection, then we can't compute any of these things explicitly. So one more question, if I can. Yeah. Um, so that Laplace then, is that the, um, I think it's called the Bokhtan Laplace or is it the rough Laplace then? Um, so is it uh, D, D, D delta plus delta D or grad star grad? Yeah, it's D delta plus delta D. Thank you. Yeah, that's right. So, um, you know, if you haven't seen this before, given that we can't compute these metrics and we can't compute these gauge fields explicitly, you might wonder how we make any progress at all. And historically, uh, the thing we've used is that a lot of the sort of coarse information about compactifications uh, comes from topological data, which doesn't need the explicit metric or the explicit gauge connection. So for example, uh, in the simplest case of the, of the standard embedding, if you take this gauge bundle to be a, an SU3 bundle, which is just the tangent bundle, you'll end up with some E6 uh, grand unified group in four dimensions with the number of particle generations, so the number of uh, uh, different types of leptons, for example, fixed by this, by this topological number, which is just the Euler characteristic of your manifold. So in this way, you can, you can go away and scan for string models that might give you realistic physics. You can you know, compute things like how many generations there are, is the gauge group correct, 
but you still actually can't compute anything sharp about these models. Uh, even more, more worryingly, when you move away from these so-called standard embeddings to non-standard embeddings, uh, which tend to give more realistic uh, physics, then even these sort of calculations become more difficult. So as I sort of hinted at many, many times here, the problem, uh, the issue with calculating sharp numbers is that uh, the resulting four-dimensional theory has n equal to one supersymmetry, is minimally supersymmetric. So its physics is controlled by a superpotential and a Kala potential. Um, and those come from the 10-dimensional theory uh, by exp effectively expanding your 10-dimensional your modes, modes, modes in terms of modes in the six-dimensional space and on the four-dimensional space, and then taking some harmonic basis for the forms on the Calabria. And then things like the super couplings in the superpotential or uh, the matter field Kala metric are computed by certain overlap integrals of these harmonic modes over the Calabian. And obviously, you have two problems here. First of all, you don't know what you mean by a harmonic mode unless you have the metric. That's what uh, goes into the Laplace equation. So you can't even compute what you mean by a harmonic mode. And then you also just need to normalize these modes. You need to know the normalization of the kinetic terms. And for that, you need to be able to compute this inner product here. And this Hodge star, again, depends on the, the Calabia metric and also the metric on the bundle, neither of which you have in anything other than extremely uh, sort of simple models. So the problem you have if you, if you want to link string theory to sort of real physics is that you have these two unknowns, the, the metric and the gauge connection. And without them, it's difficult to make, to make sharp predictions. So this is sort of the, the big reason why we're interested in computing these things. Sorry, Anthony. Yeah. It, this must all still be sort of standard embedding, right? Because the uh, the massless mode, so, so the massless modes, if you're away from the standard embedding, aren't actually harmonic. They're sort of something more complicated because you have the, the gauge bundle basically sort of, and, 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 and Bianchi identity mix everything up. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, sorry, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, so like even the metric, like there's there's not really a harmonic gauge for the metric. There's there's a different there's a holomorphic gauge, but not. Yeah. So yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's that's correct. Yeah. And I guess that's maybe like a complication when you try to extend this for yeah away from the standard embedding, because something that's that, that's very confusing is how do you do collusive line reduction when you don't really have harmonic reps? Because when you write down that Laplacian. Um, it starts off life as sort of um, d dagger d, and then if you're on some harmonic gauge, you can add the the, the other term for free. Um, but yeah, if you don't have sort of harmonic reps, then um, yeah, what do you do? I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, sorry it, that uh, if you move towards a standard of any, yeah, it gets it gets much more complicated, and unfortunately, the models are much more interesting, right? That's the... But that's right. Even yeah. In, you know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, even if I wanted to like the ones you some, even if I wanted to do some sort of a very straightforward line bundle standard model, like I, I right. still I still can't compute these things. Right. right. That's very interesting. Anyway, sorry, keep going. Uh, so with that sort of motivation for why we want these Calabria metrics, um, I'm gonna sort of tell you. Uh, something about the definition of Calabria metrics and also how you actually get these things numerically. So this is sort of building on work from the past decade or so and some sort of new progress in actually computing uh, the spectrum of these, of these metrics. And then the last bit of the talk, I'm going to tell you sort of an, an interesting use for these things, which is uh, related to conformal field theories. So let me start with a quick review of, of how one computes uh, the Ricci fly metrics. Uh, this is just a quick reminder of Calabia manifolds. So Calabia manifolds, by definition, uh, I'm going to take them to be compact, are just Kähler manifolds, which, should which admit Ricci flat metrics. And these are all going to be six-dimensional uh, for this bit of the talk. So the nice thing about this, the, the thing which has let us uh, build these very coarse models of particle physics over the past 30 years or so, is that uh, we have existence proofs for these kind of manifolds, for these metrics. In particular, if you just have uh, a Kähler manifold 
with, with, with vanishing first churn class, then there exists a Ricci flat metric on that manifold. And you can use the existence of this thing to start building models uh, and then using the topological information of the manifold to, to constrain the model further. However, existence here does not give you any explicit construction of the metric. And there are no non-trivial Calabian metrics known explicitly at this point. The two sort of uh, uh, ingredients to this definition here are that the manifold is Kähler you, and that it has, sorry, go ahead. Well, I guess here you really mean compact because yeah, you, compact. you were always control. Yeah, compact. So let's unpack this definition a little bit. So uh, these manifolds are Kähler. What that means is that there is a uh, real local function called a Kähler potential, uh, which gives rise to a real closed two form J, which is just the Kähler form on my, on my manifold. And I construct that just by taking uh, two mixed derivatives of the Kähler potential. Uh, in particular, this thing is, is non-degenerate and wedging it with itself three times uh, defines a volume form on the manifold, which you can think of as being the volume defined by, by, the, by the Kähler metric. The vanishing the first churn class just tells you that the canonical bundle of the manifold is trivial. And what this means is that there's a complex nowhere vanishing closed three zero form uh, omega here. And this thing is often called the holomorphic form. And these two bits of information together, so Kähler and C1, C1 is zero, means that uh, this manifold emits a metric of SU3 holonomy. Uh, and those SU3 holonomy metrics are precisely the, the Ricci flat Calabio metrics that we're after. So curiously, again, this three zero form defines a volume form. I just wedge it with uh, the conjugate of itself. And that then gives me some, some volume form defined by uh, the three zero form on this manifold. So if you like, it comes with two definitions of the volume form and these things are related by the, by the condition of being Ricci flat. So the simplest way to construct uh, these kind of manifolds, so just the manifolds and not the Ricci flat metric on them are just as hypersurfaces in projective space. And the classic example of this is the quintic hypersurface uh, or the Fermat hypersurface, which I'll call Q here in, uh, in P4. So P4 has a homogeneous coordinates Z0 through Z4. If I write a quintic equation in those projective coordinates and set it to zero, this is just some holomorphic function, uh, the zero locus of which carves out a hypersurface inside the projective space. And that zero locus is precisely um, a, three dimen uh, a six dimensional Calabian manifold. So, it emits a Ricci flat metric and it's Kähler. So the, the three zero form, the holomorphic three zero form is entirely determined by this defining equation Q. So for example, in the patch of projective space where Z zero is non-vanishing or Z zero is one, there's an exact formula for what the three zero form is in terms of the, the coordinates and the defining equation. So you can write this down exactly. The actual metric on the hypersurface, G, and the Kähler form, J, are then determined by a choice of Kähler potential, a choice of real function K, local real function K, as a function of the coordinates on the Calabian. So the important thing here is that um, the, the natural metric that you'd get just by thinking about this as a hypersurface embedded in P4 is not Ricci flat. If it were, then our job would, would be done. Instead, we need to find out some way of determining uh, the Kähler potential that, is that, uh, that will give rise to a Ricci flat metric. And that's the, the sort of the name of the game here. So you, I give you a defining equation Q that defines the Calabria manifold for me. I get the three zero form for free from that. And then the question is, what is the corresponding Kähler potential that gives a Ricci flat metric? And the whole business of numerically determin determining these things reduces to trying to fix uh, an expression for the Kähler potential that gets as close as possible to Ricci flat. If you do that, you then have an approximate Calabian metric. So one thing you might wonder is, you know, imagine I come along and I tell you I found a Ricci flat metric on your favorite Calabian, I hand you a Kähler potential. How do you actually check 
that it is indeed Ritchie flat, or how do you check how close it is to Ritchie flat? I'm claiming it's an approximate metric. So obviously, if you want to just compute, uh, check that it's Ritchie flat, you could compute the Ritchie tensor and see how close it is to zero pointwise over the manifold. But because it's Calabi Yau, uh, there's actually a slightly nicer condition that involves fewer derivatives um, that effectively comes from the Mont-Jean-Pair equation. And that just says that the ratio of these two volumes, the volumes defined by the Kähler form J and the holomorphic form omega, should be pointwise constant over the manifold. So if I give you a Kähler potential such that uh, the volume defined by it is uh, equal to the volume defined by the holomorphic three form, there's some constant pointwise over the manifold, you're done. That's the Ritchie flat metric. That's the unique Ritchie flat metric. So we can use this to actually uh, build uh, some sort of measure of how far away we are from Ritchie flat. We just define uh, a functional of the Kähler potential, which I've called sigma here, and we just define that to be uh, how far away this ratio of the volumes is from being unity, where I've just normalized these things so that this constant is one, and then I just integrate the, the absolute difference of those things all over the manifold. So if you like, this thing just adds up the error of how far away you are from Ritchie flat all over the manifold. So, so this thing's always positive, and the exact Ritchie flat metric is the unique metric uh, that has sigma is, is zero. So this gives you a way of measuring yeah. how accurate you are. So, and th so um, I think I was about to ask, so I was going to ask how hard is it to compute that integral if you, I'm thinking numerically, but I guess you, you if your measure is the, the measure defined by the holomorphic volume form, which you know exactly. Yeah, that does right. A, um, yeah, you see, so you, you know the measure defined by the home of the volume form exactly. And then mm -hmm. the volume defined by the Kähler potential is just two derivatives of the Kähler potential, then hit it with a determinant. And once you, you figure out all the right numbers and you figure out a way of integrating over your manifold numerically, then you can compute this thing. And, 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 and this, this measure, the, the volume of omega is just sort of I omega, omega bar. Yeah, that's right. Um, now, omega is not really, not really a form, right? Like it's a section of a line bundle over the moduli space. So you, you, it's ambiguous up to sort of phases. Um, we're, we're, we're at a fixed point in the moduli space, though. This is this is all for a fixed value of the moduli. A fixed value. Oh yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm doing this numerically, so you know, the, the, there's a choice of complex structure when I pick this equation. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what this means is that finding the rich, once you've picked a Calabria manifold by picking one of these equations, finding the Ritchie flat metric amounts to finding a single function k, the k of potential, that minimizes sigma. And the smaller you can make sigma, the more accurate that is. So obviously, rather than just trying to parameterize the space of all possible k of potentials, it's useful to have some sort of ansatz that lets you you know, progressively refine how accurate your metric is. And the way to do that uh, goes back to an idea by um, Chan and Donaldson, and that's the idea of using algebraic metrics. So there's a natural Kähler metric on projective space, which is just given by the Fubini state Kähler potential. So I just take uh, the product of the coordinates, hit it with a log so it scales properly, and this thing just defines the Fubini study metric on P4. Obviously, I can just pull that metric back to the hypersurface, um, and that will give me a metric uh, on the clavier, which will not be Ritchie flat. I can generalize this ansatz just by sticking a Hermitian matrix uh, into the Kähler potential here. And then when I pull the, the resulting metric back to the hypersurface, I have some degrees of freedom in H, some parameters, that, that, that I can play with to try to, try to, get, us, to get closer to being Ritchie flat to reducing the sigma functional. So for example, here, I will just have 25 real parameters that I can play with, which is not enough. You know, If you do this and you vary the parameters to minimize sigma, you don't get very close to being Ritchie flat. It's not a very good approximation. Obviously, because um, you know, Calabria metrics are, we think, extremely complicated analytically. There are no known expressions. So if you could do it using something of this form, 
uh, it would be, be quite surprising. So what we need to do is to sort of expand this ansatz to get more parameters to better approximate the clavium, uh, the Ritchie fly metric. And we do that just by using a generalization of Fubini study. So what we do is we, we replace the coordinates z in the ansatz with homogeneous polynomials, which are called S alpha here, of some given degree k. So for example, at degree two, these are all the um, degree two polynomials or monomials in the coordinates on the projective space. I can then write down an ansatz for the KL potential, where again, I have this, this matrix of constant parameters, H alpha beta, and this now has 225 real parameters in it. So what this means is that, um, so, and as I increase the degree K of these polynomials, I have uh, order K to the four parameters. So as I increase K, I have more degrees of freedom in this ansatz. And then when I compute this sigma uh, functional, which tells me how close I am to Ritchie flat, I have more degrees of freedom to play with to try to get the resulting approximate metric closer and closer to the honest Calabria metric. And if you want to say, um, this slide cut off there, but so the rough idea for how this works is that uh, products of these polynomials that appear in here, you should think of as giving a, a basis for the eigenspaces of, of Laplacian on, on the projective space. So this is like an expansion of the Kala potential in spherical harmonics on the projective space. And you're then playing with the parameters in the expansion. So the question then is, how do you fix this matrix of parameters, these H alpha beta, to get as close as possible to Ritchie flat? How do you find the best approximation within your, within your, within your ansatz? And there are historically sort of three approaches. There's an iterative procedure that goes back to Donaldson, um, where you sort of iterate through and progressively get better. Um, you can try to just minimize sigma directly as a function of the parameters using Mathematica. This is very accurate for metrics with high degrees of symmetry, but very slow if you don't have any symmetries. Or more recently, you can treat uh, sigma as a loss function for a neural network. And this is sort of the state of the art. One can also actually just find k or the metric directly rather than going through this ansatz using a neural network. Um, but again, this is sort of this is usually less accurate, and it's, this is sort of you know cutting edge stuff is uh, still being developed. So I won't I won't talk, talk much more about that. So as I mentioned to Jock, um, I, I'm sort of sweeping a lot of the complexity under the rug here. These are all numerical integrals carried out by Monte Carlo. You have to figure out how to sample points on the Calabi Yao so that you're, you're picking points according to the Calabi Yao measure and not some other auxiliary measure. So there are a lot of things that go into this numerical work. Um, but the rough idea is you can, you can compute these things. Everything is computable. So you, you go away, you, know, you give me your favorite Calabi Yao. I can, depending on how long you're willing to run your computer for, give you a good approximation to the Clavier metric, a numerical approximation that you can then compute with. So then you can ask, well, what, do I, what can I compute with this? Well, the first thing you can compute is just the spectrum of the Laplacian on these spaces. And the idea, uh, the way one does this in, is sort of as follows. Um, and we'll see that sort of the, the operators in the CFT that I talk about later are gonna be determined by eigenmodes in the Clavier. Um, so having this information will also be useful later, later, later in the talk. So we're going to compute the eigenmodes, which are going to be PQ eigenforms of the Laplacian on the manifold. And this is just the Laplacian defined by um, d d dagger uh, plus d dagger d. And then it's just some eigenvalue equation for these modes. Obviously, because this is a Laplacian, the eigenvalues are real and, uh, and positive. And in general, they can appear with some multiplicity due to the discrete symmetries of the Calabria. So what I want to tell you is give you a way to compute the spectrum given one of these approximate Calabria metrics. So again, the rough idea is that you, you, need, some, you need to make some approximation here, right? I can't expand uh, uh, the space of all eigenmodes of some infinite dimensional space. So you should think that we need some other approximation. So first of all, let's just change this into you know, the kind of way you compute a matrix, a matrix element in quantum mechanics, for example. So let's start with some non-orthonormal basis of functions or some non-orthonormal basis of PQ forms, which I'm just going to call alpha A here. One can then just expand the eigenmodes in terms of this, in terms of this basis. 
And then the Laplace equation just becomes a generalized eigenvalue problem for the eigenvalue and the coefficients uh, that appear in this expansion. So in particular, if I just expand out the Laplace equation, uh, I get a matrix element of the Laplace operator on these basis functions, and then just some other inner product of the basis functions them themselves, which reflects the fact that these things are not orthonormal. Again, these matrix elements are defined by integrals. These integrals contain Hodge stars, so it needs the information of the Calabian metric. Obviously, computing with uh, infinite dimensional bases is not, is not good for computers. They get very unhappy. So you need to truncate to some finite approximate basis. And you do that just by taking degree K5 polynomials in the coordinates and constructing uh, functions like this. So for example, for, for scalars, you just, you, you, just you just take the degree K5 functions of the coordinates, you multiply by degree K5 functions of the coordinates conjugated, and then divide through uh, by this denominator to make sure that these things are well-defined functions when you pull them back to the hypersurface. What one then does is you, you take your numerical Calabria metric, you take this finite basis of functions, and you compute the matrix elements for the Laplace operator and the inner product of the bases numerically. And you can do this for every choice of P and Q. And then you just find the, eigen, the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. And this gives you the spectrum of the, of the Laplacian for these metrics. And it also tells you about the eigenvalues themselves. So this is sort of a little, a little, a little abstract. So let me give you a very, very concrete example where you can do this, which is sort of the, the simplest Calabria we know, which is somewhat trivial, which is just that of, that of the torus. So two-dimensional flat tori are calabi yau The Ricci flat metric is just the flat metric, and you can compute the spectrum explicitly. So, so Milner did this back in 63. So these flat tori are defined by a choice of complex structure, tau, where I think of this thing as just uh, the complex plane modded out by some lattice, where the lattice is generated by, by these vectors. The eigenvalues are then just given by this, this formula here, which is uh, a function of A and B, which I should think of as being a function of the complex structure of the torus. So here's an example of Calabria, which is, I can actually compute something exactly. There's a very nice uh, torus called the equilateral torus, where I just take tau to be e to the i pi upon three, and this generates a hexagonal lattice in the following way. And it turns out that this is equivalent to the curve in P2 defined by this particular uh, defining equation, which I should think of as being like a Fermat cubic, a Fermat cubic. And these have, both have sort of obvious C3 symmetries that you can match to to check that these two things are actually the same. So what one does is that you can now compute the Calabria metric on the torus, it's just the flat metric, and then go away and compute uh, the eigenmodes, the eigenvalues and the eigenfunctions for this example. So roughly how this works is the follows. So you you specify the Calabi Yau by the defining equation Q is zero, which in this case is just this guy. And then, the, and then you compute the, the metric numerically using one of these methods I, I, I talked about earlier. You then pick some finite basis for PQ forms of some given degree, where the degree determines how accurate um, your approximation is. And you can then just solve numerically for the spectrum, the eigenvalues, and the eigenmodes uh, for each choice of P and Q, where you use Monte Carlo to evaluate the integrals. And um, let's just ignore that. So you can do this exactly. You can compute the spectrum for the 0, 0, the 1, 0, and the 1, 1 forms. And you find that they agree exactly with the, with the exact formula that I flashed up earlier. Uh, it turns out that these three spectra are all the same uh, due to some, some particular symmetries that you get for, for two-dimensional Calabi hours, because the Hodge star commutes with Laplacian, del commutes with delta. And then this together with the Hodge decomposition just tells you that actually uh, the one zero, the zero zero, and the one one spectra are just the same actually. So this is sort of a sort of a toy example to see that this works. And then of course you can go away and do any old example you like. You can go away and do you know the quintic. You can do the K three. You'll again get tables of these kind of numbers, um, which I, I have in the appendix if anyone wants to look at them. But so it's just sort of staring at these things it doesn't tell you anything. So one, one thing I realized when, when I started computing these things is that uh, 
you tell people you can compute this information, you know, for, for decades now we've heard one of the issues with computing real numbers from string theory is that we don't have these metrics. It turns out that when you tell people you have these metrics and you can compute things, people, people aren't exactly sure what to look at first, um, which is somewhat depressing, but also, I guess, not too surprising. If you've, if you've never had this information to hand, you haven't really thought about what you would do with it. And in particular, just staring at tables of these numbers doesn't tell you very much. So you need some other application for what you're going to do with these things. And the particular thing I'm going to tell you about is how you can use these kind of, these kind of tools, these numerical tools, to think about certain 2D conformal field theories. Sorry, so, Anthony, can we just second? Yeah. Go back to your table. Yeah. So this is for um, the torus. Is this the this is the equilateral torus? This saying? is the equilateral torus, that's right. Um, can you sort of perturb away from it? Can so can you just tweak A or B? and see how the numbers change? Does that, is that computable? Or did you use heaps of information about, or did you use those Z3 symmetries? No, 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 no so, the, so the, the algorithm just uses any old Q you like. Right. I just picked this one because I knew that, I knew that this particular clavier was this, equal, was this equilateral torus. Right, um, right. And, and, I mean, I haven't thought about it much, but there must also be a map between, you know, arbitrary choices of parameters here and the choice of the complex structure on the torus in terms of tau. So you could go away and check them as well if you want. But the, the algorithm is completely agnostic to, uh, to, the, to the defining equation that you give it. So if you replaced um, one of those coefficients in Q by and instead of one, like 1.001 or something, yeah. Um, what happens to the table? Do, do those numbers sort of, because they're integer numbers, aren't they? Um, yeah. I guess. Yeah. 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 yeah um, well, I mean, in, so if I look at this formula here, right, if I start shifting A and B uh, yeah. by values that aren't integers, then I'll just get non integer, non integer, non, non -integer eigenvalues. Oh, right. Okay. So. Yeah. So it is the four pi squared here that makes things non integer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so for example, you, you can actually, you can, you can start from like the Fermat quintic and you can follow oh. a trajectory through the moduli, through complex structure moduli space and just see what happens to the eigenvalues. And you can track that. Yeah. That's what, yeah. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can do yeah. that. Okay. Cool. So something, something nice about Calabiaz is that they're actually related to the certain uh, interacting conformal field theories. So conformal field theories are sort of a, a foundation for understanding string theory and very interesting in their own right. And you might wonder how you actually compute the spectrum of a conformal field theory. And in general, this is extremely difficult and just, and just not possible often, right? So a lot of our information about conformal field theories, about interacting conformal field theories, really comes from considering them at very special points in their moduli space, such as um, you know, certain points where they're, where they're quotients by discrete groups, or there are certain singularities in the moduli space, and, and we have more information about what's going on. The other place we get information about conformal field theories is when those conformal field theories are also supersymmetric. And then there are, there are objects or there are quantities that are protected by supersymmetry, such as counts of BPS, BPS operators, uh, where we can you know, explicitly compute numbers that count things, or we can compute things using something like modular invariance. But none of these things give us information about the actual spectrum of the conformal field theory itself, if it's interacting. I just want to compute, say, the scaling dimensions. I can't do that. The way we link the problem of conformal field theories back to the geometric problem that I was talking about with the Calabi-Yaus is that Calabi-Yaus actually appear as target spaces uh, for certain conformal field theories, in particular conformal field theories that you get by flowing from sigma models. So if I take a sigma model with a calabi target space that will flow to some 2,2 conformal field theory and 
information about that conformal field theory is contained in the geometry of the Calabi-Yau. In particular, the thing that we're going to see is contained in the, in the, in the, in the geometry of the Calabi-Yau is the spectrum of operators. So in, if you like one way of seeing this, this, this direct link between the geometry uh, and the CFT is that in the large volume limits where the, where the Calabi is large, uh, the low lying modes of the CFT are effectively computed by quantum mechanics. So uh, instead of uh, a two dimensional CFT problem, it reduces to a quantum mechanical problem where the Hamiltonian that you're considering is the Laplacian on the Calabi target space. So if you can compute the spectrum of that Laplacian, it gives you information about the spectrum of the conformal field theory, the low lying, low energy spectrum of the conformal field theory. So is that, is that 82 Witten paper, um, uh, Morse theory and supersymmetry? Uh, it's either, is that one or his one on, um, I think it is that one, yeah. So th there are two that year and he talks about this in both of them, I think. Okay, shame I didn't yeah. try to understand it better. So purely as a question in terms of the conformal field theory, let me try to sharpen this question. If I just take the, my, my 2D conformal field theory and I quantize it on a sphere, then um, the, the spectrum of operators is just determined uh, by the Hamiltonian acting on some modes uh, with some particular scaling dimensions di. And the question I'm gonna be interested in isn't um, the, the spectrum of a single conformal field theory, I'm going to ask a very general question about uh, ensembles of theories. So if I have collections of theories, what kind of properties do the, do, do the spectrum of the theorems of, of the theories have? So what we're going to do is take an ensemble of CFTs, where I have, so I take lots of different theories uh, with different values of the moduli, for example, and then I ask if the scaling dimensions of the operators in those theories have any interesting statistical properties. So to answer this question, uh, not only do you need to be able to compute the spectrum of an interacting conformal field theory uh, that is in general not solvable or rational and so on, you need to compute the spectrum of a whole family of these conformal field theories. So you have something that you can you know, get statistics from. Um, in particular, this, this wasn't possible until these new numerical methods sort of came to light. There's some work on this for free theories, but I mean, interacting CFTs are a whole different ballgame. So let me sharpen this link between the, the geometry and the conformal field theories. So the conformal field theories I'm thinking about are those defined by sigma models with calabi yau targets. Um, in general, these theories will be rational, not solvable. The central charge is fixed by the complex dimension of the calabi yau uh, these theories are, I'd say, well understood using things like mirror symmetry, supersymmetry, and so on. But if we want to investigate the actual spectra of uh, operators in the theory, the honest, you know, non-BPS spectra, we need to be able to compute uh, the actual, the actual uh, scaling dimensions of operators. So these CFTs naturally come in families. So they're sort of nice, uh, nice examples where we can actually find an ensemble of theories. In particular, these families of CFTs that are defined from sigma models on calabi yaus are labeled by choices of KL moduli and complex structure moduli. So you can imagine taking one of these theories, as you vary the complex structure moduli, you get a family of theories that are connected to it, and you can compute the spectra for each one of these theories in turn. And you could then think about how the scaling dimensions uh, of operators in these theories change as a function of moduli, for example. Or you could think about the statistics of the scaling dimensions, uh, so averaged over moduli space. So the name of the game is that uh, if we vary the moduli, we get whole uh, families, whole ensembles of, of theories, and we then want to compute the spectrum of these theories and see if we have any interesting statistics. So the way we connect this to the geometrical calculation we did earlier is that 
in the large volume limit, um, this 2D conformal field theory reduces to a quantum mechanics uh, on the Calabi Yau. In particular, this means that the spectrum uh, of, uh, I think these are very zero primary operators, correspond to the PQ eigenforms of the Laplacian on the Calabi Yau with the Calabi Yau metric. So if I can compute the spectrum of the Laplacian acting on these PQ eigenforms, it gives me back the spectrum of these operators. So it tells me something about the low lying modes in the CFT. So given one of these operators built like this, where these are the world tree fermions, then I can construct the quantum numbers. So the scaling dimension D and the spin J, and then providing I take uh, an appropriate large volume limit, uh, the light operators in the theory are those that come just from the scalar eigenmodes. So the idea here is that uh, the Laplacian itself scales with the inverse volume. And so uh, as I make the Calabi Yau large, I go to the large volume limit. It's only when P and Q are zero that I get light modes. When P, when P and Q are, are greater than zero, then I'm, I'm already above the scale of the scale eigenmodes. So for what follows, I'm just going to talk about the scalar eigenmodes. Good. Are there any questions about this before I, before I go on? Oh, good. Is it worthwhile to think about the massive modes? Yes, yeah, so, 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 so these, what's a good way of saying this? So the, the eigenmodes, so if I just think about the scalar eigenmodes, the ones with P and Q are zero, then the, the scaling dimensions D I get here come from the massive modes on the, on, of the Laplacian. Right, I get, right. Right, so, Wait, so sorry, say that. So, so for example, if, if I just look at the scalar eigenmodes, the only yeah. zero mode is the constant mode. Yeah. yeah. So everything else is massive. Then. Okay. So it's sort so of yes. And, 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 and then, the, and then this, the spectrum of the low lying operators is coming from computing the low lying massive modes of the Laplacian on the Calabi Yeah. All right. So, so, in, so this is slightly different from, from what you want for, for phenomenology, right? So for phenomenology, you're interested in the basically just the zero modes, right? Right. You want, right. You, you want the zero modes, you want to be able to compute everything about the zero modes. If you're interested in properties of CFTs, you're also interested yeah. in the massive modes because they tell you something about the full spectrum of the CFT or the low lying That's spectrum right. of the CFT. That's right. I mean, we're only interested in the light modes and phenomenology because we're not very powerful. You know? Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah. If we could do the LH, we saw like, oh, so he's spectrum here are the massive string modes, you know, then we'd be very interested in the massive modes, but. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if we could do, if we could do like, yeah, string mode or KK, so KK scale calculations, this would be important, right? <laughs> it would be great. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, if, if you could do those kind of experiments and figure out, you know, if you find some mode at the LHC that doesn't match anything else, if you could tell yeah. whether or not it's a KK mode. <laughs> yeah. That would be very important. Well, I I was sort of thinking, asking was, um, yeah, so aside from the obvious thing that we just talked about, i.e. matching with the experiment, what, what do the massive modes um, physically, why would you care? So um, is, is there any reason aside from we want to know this for the sake of knowing it? Um, what do we do with this information about the massive modes? Or is it just I mean, sort of... Yeah, is... for, for, for learning your phenomenology, I, I don't know what to do with them, right? Right. But if what about formally? I mean, so, so what I'm going to tell you is that, um, you know, if you're interested in the informal properties of CFTs, for example, then you can, you, you can find interesting statistics in the spectra of these of these things. Okay. So okay. So I'll, I'll be quiet. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're just interested in the property of two D CFTs, right? This gives you some highly non-trivial information. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, I'll let I'll let you tell us about it. So we get access to the spectrum of the CFT by computing geometric data about the Clavier. So with a numerical Clavier metric, we can then compute the spectrum of eigenmodes, and that then gives us information about low-lying modes in the CFT that we can then play with. So if we want to look at um, how many of these uh, spectra behave, if we have lots of these theories, which will differ in values of the moduli, um, one way to generate the geometric, the corresponding geometric information is just by taking ensembles of Calabi-Yau geometries. And there's a simple way to do that. So the easiest way to do that is just to, is to vary over the complex structure moduli, the complex structure parameters. So for example, if I just consider a generalization of the, of the quintic calabi I told you about earlier, so I take uh, a hypersurface in P4 defined by the vanishing locus of a quintic equation in the, in the coordinates, when now I just allow uh, arbitrary coefficients, which I call C here in the equation, as I vary these Cs, I'm effectively varying the 101 complex structure parameters of the Calabi-Yau. And to each of these calabi that corresponds a CFT. And the spectral data of that CFT the low-lying spectral data is computed by the geometry of the calabi -Yau. So by computing uh, the Laplacian on the calabi -Yau, we get information about the corresponding CFTs. And these naturally come in very large dimensional families. So the way we're going to pick these on the, these CFTs is just by picking these Cs randomly uh, from the disk in the complex plane. And they're just going to be you know, from, from the unit disk in the complex plane. And this is sort of the dumbest thing you could do. So for each of these examples, you, you pick some random values of these coefficients, the Cs, you then compute an approximate Calabi-Yau metric, and you then compute the spectrum of the scale of Laplacian. That thing tells you about the low-lying modes in the CFT, the low-lying operators. As I said, you compute the Calabi-Yau metric for some particular choice of moduli. You compute the spectrum of delta, and you then do this for many different choices of complex, of, of complex structure parameters. So many different choices of defining equation. And you then end up with an ensemble of conformal field theory data that you can do statistics on, that you can analyze this statistically. And what we're gonna do is compare these statistics to ensembles of random matrices. And we're gonna find that this, this, this sort of curious map between the two. So let me just tell you something, something quickly about random matrix theory. So random matrix theory is a, is a very old topic um, that has somehow sort of found more use very recently. So random matrix statistics are a hallmark of something called quantum chaos. And this goes back to um, a conjecture by uh, BGS, Behigas, Giannini, and, and Schmidt. And it basically says that systems with ergodic classical limits, so systems which probe all of phase space classically, um, display random matrix theory statistics in their quantum energy levels. So if you take some, some classical system, uh, which is defined by some, uh, uh, by some Laplace operator, and you then think of the corresponding Schrodinger equation for the system uh, and analyze the spectrum of that Schrodinger operator, uh, you'll find that the spectrum exhibits uh, level repulsion, which is a classic sign of random matrix theory and also long range rigid rigidity, which I'll talk about in a second. So random matrix theory has appeared all over the place. It's in nuclear physics. Um, it's in classical models of billiards. It's also appeared in, in the SYK model of gravity. And it now has um, sort of very, very, very strange links with black hole physics, quantum gravity. And effectively, this all comes down to the fact that um, you expect black hole energy levels to be discrete, non-degenerate, and in, in a specific way, chaotic. Um, and just by holography, uh, this sort of suggests that if you just take generic CFTs, um, these things should somehow be chaotic in their behavior. And precisely what this means isn't very clear, because if you take a generic CFT, you often can't compute anything about it. So saying that it's chaotic is, is um, it's sort of difficult to disprove, right? So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you one example where you can actually compute these things. 
and you see these examples of chaos. So we're going to see random matrix theory popping out. So before we get there, I need to tell you some, some things you should expect from the spectrum of this uh, very large family of conformal field theories. So something to match to. So first of all, what is random matrix theory? Random matrix theory uh, is just uh, the, the well, random matrix statistics are the statistics of eigenvalues of matrices where the entries where the entries of the matrices are just randomly distributed according to a Gaussian. There are then different random matrix distributions depending on what kind of symmetries you enforce on those random matrices. So for example, in the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, you're considering n by n real symmetric matrices with, uh, with random uh, entries in the matrices. The, the distribution is then just the eigenvalues of these matrices. So, you know, if you want to play with these things, you can just, you can do this on Mathematica. What we, what we want to do is to compare the CFT data to the universal features of random matrix theory. So what you find with random matrix theory is that there are very, there are very um, particular bits, uh, behavior of spectra that depend on the precise physical system. And then there are universal predictions that, cut, that, are, that, are, that are predicted by the random matrix statistics. And it's those latter things we're going to be interested in. So for example, uh, one case where uh, there's sort of a precise um, uh, prediction from random matrix theory, which doesn't, which isn't universal, is the density of eigenvalues. So if I just take um, these m by n real symmetric matrices and I compute the eigenvalues, I see the density of these eigenvalues sits in this in, in this thing called Wigner's semicircle. And in general, we this won't be the case for us because the eigenvalues of our Laplacians are all positive. So this is not going to sit uh, in, a, in a nice semicircle over the origin. So this is an, an example of something which is not universal. What is universal, however, is, uh, is fluctuations in the spectrum. And those are the things we're going to look at. So perhaps the sort of the most famous or the most obvious behavior due to random matrix <laughs> theory. <laughs> Hello. Can you? I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, I good. I just I, I had I had a lot of reverb. I thought there was a question. Yeah, we all got the reverb. Right. Okay, good. So let me just tell you about some uh, diagnostics of random matrix theory. So if I give you a set of uh, a set of spectra, how do you check for random matrix theory in the spectrum? So the first way is to look for eigenvalue repulsion. So this is just the idea that uh, on average, there is a tendency for the eigenvalues of random matrices to repel each other. And this is telling you something about the fluctuations in the spectrum. In particular, uh, the probability of a distance S between consecutive eigenvalues uh, goes as something linear and then an exponentially damped term. Uh, and in particular, this means that the uh, the distance between eigenvalues on average, S, is peaked away from the origin. So the eigenvalues don't like clustering. They like being separated. If your eigenvalues were just randomly distributed, so for example, if you just take your CFTs and the spectra of those CFTs, the actual spectra are just randomly distributed according to Poisson statistics, then you'd find that the, the level spacings here uh, P1 of S, just drop off exponentially. And in particular, they, they like being close together. Whereas if they come from random matrix theory, they like being slightly further apart. So this is something very sharp that you can check. Um, in particular, this kind of information depends on all endpoint correlation functions of the eigenvalue of, of, the, of the operators in the spectrum. So it's really, it's probing a lot of information. The second thing we're interested in is something called spectral rigidity. And this all comes from just thinking about the two-point function between two eigenvalues in the spectrum, or two operators, if you like, where S is just the distance between any two eigenvalues. So spectral rigidity, which is coming from the decay of the connected piece of the correlator, 
is just the fluctuation in the number of eigenvalues in a typical interval. So I take the spectrum and I look at an interval L and I count how many eigenvalues there are in that interval. And then I ask, well, what is the typical number of eigenvalues as I scan over the spectrum? So for random matrix theory, you find it goes as log L. So as you, as you change the size of the interval, um, the number of eigenvalues doesn't, the, the fluctuation in the number of eigenvalues doesn't change very much. If it were Poisson or just random, then it would grow linearly. Finally, the, the sort of last uh, diagnostic that we're, we're gonna look at is something called the spectral form factor. So if you like, um, the spectral form factor is just the Fourier transform of the two-point function of the eigenvalues. And if you like, this is just the analytically continued partition function. So if you considered uh, a quantum mechanics where the Hamiltonian is just the Laplacian, so that these lambdas are the eigenvalues, and then you analytically continue the partition function, then what you find is the spectral form vector. And in the case where we're just doing the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, GOE, the spectral form factor has this very nice behavior. So for 100 by 100 dimensional matrices, um, it has this ring down, this dip, it has this ramp period uh, with these oscillations. And then there's also a plateau at the end. And these are all sort of uh, diagnostics of random matrix theory, which probe uh, different length scales in the spectrum. So what we're gonna do is to compare um, the eigenvalue statistics that one can compute from Calabi-Yau CFTs with the predictions of random matrix theory. And the two examples I'm going to just flash up are the examples of K3s written as quartic equations in P3, and the example I talked about earlier, which is just quintic threefolds as quintic equations in P4. So in each of these cases, you have some defining equation. You can play around with, with the coefficients in the defining equation that varies the complex structure for you, and it gives you very large families of CFTs for which you can compute the spectrum. You can then analyze the spectrum statistically and compute the various things that I just told you, the nearest neighbor level spacings, the spectral rigidity, and the spectral form factor, and compare them to what you'd expect if the spectrum were just governed by random matrix theory. Sorry, Anthony, you've already probably told us. So can you just remind me what, so lambda is the eigenvalue and rho is lambda? the density? Lambda is the eigenvalue and rho is the density. Yeah, I just that's a, yeah. Yeah, so, so here is an example of something which is not a universal th feature of random matrix theory, right? So the, so the actual spectrum is not going to be predicted by random matrix theory because in random matrix theory, you have this, uh, this semicircle law which tells you about the eigenvalues. Whereas for us, we have a Laplace equation with positive eigenvalues, um, which uh, will, will grow in density as you go up the eigenvalue scale. So here, for example, I just plotted the density of eigenvalues for a thousand different K3 CFTs. So any, any particular it. example of a K3 CFT, you'll have a few sort of a few lines where there are, where, where the eigenvalues appear. And if you do this a thousand times for different values of the complex structure moduli, uh, you get this uh, distribution, this density of the eigenvalues as an average over the moduli space of the K3 CFT. And are these like random point, like um, these random points in the moduli space? Yes. Yeah, that, so that, that was talking about a while ago where you, you, you picked the coefficients of yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you, yeah. So you see, you, you pick the coefficients in, in the defining equation just to be randomly sampled from the unit disk. And well, the, the, cross, the cross product of the cross product of a hundred unit disks or something is that right? Uh, yeah. Each, yeah. Each parameter is each of the hundred and fifteen parameters or something are, is sampled from the unit disk uniformly on the unit disk. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so for the for the quintic there are one hundred and one parameters, and for the K threes I'm talking about here there are I think nineteen. Yeah. So, so you'll have nineteen unit disks or one hundred and one unit disks. And why and is it stopping? Sorry? Is the, well, keep going. Yeah. 
so so this is a this is a very particular result which should not uh, which we should not expect to be predicted by random matrix theory whereas uh, the behavior for these fluctuation statistics such as the spectral form factor spectral rigidity or the level spacings are things which you might expect to be predicted by random matrix theory if you believe that generic CFTs are chaotic in some sense. So it's the fluctuations that are governed by random matrix theory. So you go and do this, you, uh, you beg for some time on the, on the university cluster, you run it for a few weeks, you compute all the metrics, you compute, compute all the spectra, you compute the, st the statistics, and then you calculate the same fluctuation statistics as you did for the random matrix theory. And this is what pops out. So if you if you compute the spectral form factor for this for these thousand K3 CFTs, um, you see it again displays the dip with the oscillations, a ramp period, and also the plateau. If you compute the nearest neighbor level spacings, so the probability for eigenvalues to be a certain distance apart, um, you see it pretty much exactly matches the the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So I've also pl plotted the, the Gaussian unitary ensemble, the Gaussian symplectic ensembles here, and it clearly doesn't match those. And finally, you can also compute the number variance, which is a which is a measure of how rigid the spectrum is. And again, you see it matches this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble of random matrix theory. And and sort of importantly, it's it's definitely not Poisson. So the spectrum so the spectrum of the theories themselves are not, are not just random numbers. You can do the same thing for the quintic. And again, you see that there's uh, the dip, the ramp, and the plateau that you'd expect from random matrix theory in the spectral form factor. You also see that there's a, that there's a nice match to the, the GOE for the nearest neighbor statistics. And uh, the spectral rigidity, as measured by the number variance, also matches the, the, the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. Are you worried about that in the number variance? This seems to deviate, like once you get sort of above five, the... Um... Yeah, so, 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 so both that and the fact that the, the ring down here doesn't come quite the way to, the, to meet the, the line, that's probably an artifact of the fact that we keep the first hundred or so eigenvalues. Righty, oh, righto. So this is... So, so, this so is, okay. when, when you compute the spectrum, you introduce this approximate basis of functions. How many yeah. how many functions you use determines how many eigenvalues you can calculate. Right. right. So you usually have access to like the first anywhere from the first hundred to the first thousand, depending on how slow you want things to go. And so can you just go back one. You, you you could truncate that to instead of one hundred fifty and just see if it made the difference that you are suggesting it might make that difference. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you, you, you see it does. Yeah. yeah, because the so the 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 start of the spectral form factor here is the thing that's probing large distances in the spectrum. What's the significance of the um, wavelength or whatever you like in the um, oscillations of the K3 line before it? Before it asymptotes onto the GOE line. Uh, so the the how many oscillations there are here is effectively determined by how many eigenvalues you pick. So in in it's if I go back to the GOE here, when I have a one hundred by one hundred dimensional matrix, then I get the oscillations. If I go to the formal limit where the matrices are infinite dimensional. Then the oscillations completely damp out, and I end up ju just with the ramp. So, for example, if I could really compute the entire spectrum on the K3, you'd expect these oscillations to damp completely out. Okay, thanks. It's sort of amazing those two graphs are so similar between K3 and the um, quintic. I'm, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Johan. Is there anything that can be said about multi-parameter models? I mean, they all have one kiloparameter, right? So is, is there any chance of doing anything like for a two-parameter model? Yeah, so the so obviously you, I mean, you could. So in these in these algorithms, you can pick different uh, values of the Kähler moduli. For the single Kähler modulus here, you normalize the volume, so that's not changing at all. But if you have more than one Kähler modulus, you could imagine averaging over them. The issue is that the the way the algorithm is written is that um, so changing the complex structure modulus just amounts to changing the parameters in the defining equation. Changing the Kähler modulus amounts to changing um, the, the, the set of functions you use in your ANZs. And that's harder to automate. That's harder to automate. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, let me just try to sort of summarize. So uh, what I hope I've convinced you of is that Calabia metrics really are now accessible with numerical methods. You can, you can compute the metrics. You can also compute the gauge connections in, in some cases. You can compute the spectra of these things, the PQ form spectrum. And there's some, and in particular, that spectra is some source of interesting new non-BPS data about both the geometries and 2D conformal field theories. And, and this, there should be something more that we can do with this data. So in particular, what I told you is that the spectrum of light operators in large volume CFTs, um, at least when you average over the moduli space of these things, seem to be chaotic in a, in a, in a specific sense and display uh, random matrix theory-like behavior according to this Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. So it's sort of, it's sort of tantalizing um, to wonder whether other interesting properties of the spectrum are also governed by random matrix theory like statistics. So for example, if, if, you, if you were really dreaming, you, you might hope that the actual gap to the first massive mode is somehow determined by random matrix theory. Um, at least at the moment, I, I can't find any result like that. It looks like it's just the fluctuations uh, which, uh, which are determined by random matrix theory. And it doesn't give you the actual eigenvalue densities, which is what you need to understand the gap. The other thing you might wonder is whether or not you can see uh, any sort of mirror symmetry in the non-BPS spectrum. So as far as I know, for all of these 2-2 two -two theories, you know, most of the arguments for mirror symmetry, at least the explicit you know, checks of mirror symmetry, come from looking at supersymmetric information, right? BPS quantities that you can compare on one side and the other. You might wonder if you can really check whether or not the spectrum of a CFT is actually the same as the spectrum of its mirror symmetry of, of its mirror symmetry polynomial, and and there are there are some ideas for how, how you do this. You may also wonder if you can use or check for modularity in, in these two D conformal field theories in some way. And sort of you know musing about the kind of things that you might be able to use this for, you know, there's this there's this random matrix theory like chaotic behavior. Um, in, this, in the spectra of these CFTs or in the spectra of these compactifications, if you like, you might wonder whether or not you can do something like, you know, understand the properties of typical compactifications or typical conformal field theories. Um, once one can, you know, eventually compute things like Yukawa couplings or superpotential coupling, couplings, um, uh, are the distribution of those things also governed by random matrix theory statistics, right? Maybe instead of, uh, you know, having to compute uh, couplings and masses for every one of your models, if you know that those couplings and masses are distributed according to some known distribution, then you might be able to say or, or, or put some sort of measure on how likely it is that your model will give you something physically realistic. Uh, and that will get you some way to understanding, you know, how many of these string vectors are, are, are physically accept, uh, acceptable. Uh, good. I think that's, I think that's all I have to say. Um, Thank you for listening. And if there are any more questions, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of happy to hang around. OK, I've got a, another question. Um, yeah. you, you're using the full Laplacian um, yeah. on a Kähler manifolds. But um, so the full Laplacian splits does not as a Kähler, as a Dolbo Laplacian and something else, D and D and Delta become Del bar and Del or something. Yeah. 
So you could have you could have split the Laplace in. Would that have been? Did you do that, or was it? Would that have been useful? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so for the actual for the actual numerics, yeah, you, you use the fact that it's Kähler, and then you you only compute uh, the del the del del bar Laplace in, instead of the full Laplace. Okay. Thanks. So when you were looking at a light operators, so you you had a general um, construction for forms. But the lot lot operators only in, ended up um, looking at functions. Is that right? Uh, you mean the operators? In the, you mean the operators in the CFT? Yeah, Laplace seems on functions. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. That's right. Yeah. And, and the idea there was that if you if you go to the large volume limit, then it's those scalar operators which which which, which dominate the low lying spectrum. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, so the issue with so not the issue. If you can, if you include the, the higher PQ forms, which you can do numerically, that's, that's very, it's straightforward to do. Um, you could do all this averaging business again, and then you can move away from um, the, you can move slightly away from the large volume limit I took to a slightly less large volume limit. <laughs> the, the issue is that computing the eigenmodes for the higher PQ forms are much slower. So, so getting a thousand samples would take a lot longer. Thanks. Any other question? I mean, do the harmonic P forms, PQ forms play a role? Um, I mean, you've got the Bochner Weizenbach Bock correction factors are richy on one forms. Um, so you um, Ritchie being zero means right that um, a harmonic one form is going to be parallel. I mean that's a zero a, a um, yeah zero mass solution in one forms. Is that relevant at all? Uh so that probably gives you an alternative way to compute the zero, the the, the the zero modes for the for the one forms, yeah. But um, it, 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 yeah. if if that's what you were saying. Well, there's an old theorem, you know, vanishing theorem, that so, you know there aren't any harmonic one forms on um, a manifold with um, positive Ricci tensor. Yeah, that's right. And it, and even if it's got zero Ricci tensor, it has to it has to be parallel to be um, the difference between the Laplacian and, and the rough Laplacian is is the Ricci on one forms. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not. If you're just interested in, in computing the zero modes, then that might be a slightly simpler operator to work with. Um, but um, it, it was easy enough just to use just to use the, the the Kähler properties and then just write everything down in terms of the actual Bochner Laplacian. Because so, so this way you can also um, you know it, it works for negatively and positively curved manifolds as well because it only uses the Kähler the Kählerness as the input. So you can also repeat all this for let's say P three for example, just the honest modes on P three. You can also compute analytically, and you can check that the the whole spectrum of PQ forms matches exactly. So, and I, I was trying to use sort of the the minimal input into the calculation. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. So we might leave it there. Or, um, but yeah, the rest of his evening. So. Yeah, on behalf of everyone. Anthony, let me thank you for giving our seminar. It was a beautiful one. Um, and we'll reconvene again in a month. Thank you. Thanks, Anthony.